Welcome to another episode of Talking with Kevin and Son. Today we are recording today because we have a very special guest, and so we're minus my co-host, my son, Theo McLemore. We are talking about implementing a system that needs to change. We're monitoring or creating solutions that will either disregard, discard or support life changes. Today we have best-selling um, author Nancy Picard. So this show is called People We Should Know. Let me get the hard part uh, out of the way. This episode is brought to you by RMK Productions, a division of 10 United, the podcast network. Through the power of story, our mission is to uplift, inspire, share stories and experience perspectives using the framework of teaching and learning and modeling. Our purpose is hope, creating opportunities and helping other people every day. This episode is brought to you by our sponsor, Sam Sarah Gear a brand that was created by a father that's paying tribute to a daughter that died from an eating disorder. Fashion is designed with love and fashions that will knock you out. And ladies and gentlemen, best-selling author, personal trainer, and life coach, certified life coach, Miss Nancy Picard. Welcome, welcome, welcome to our podcast. How you doing? And happy 4th of July weekend. I'm great. And same to you. And thank you for having me. Oh, no problem. I, I know we talked um, earlier off camera and there's been so many things that you have done. We have so many things in common. Um, personal trainer to life coach. How did that transformation happen? Well, I was a personal trainer for 16 years while I was married. And um, when I got divorced, I, a few years later, I sold my gym and I moved to Colorado. I was in New Jersey. And, and then I never, that was it. I never picked it up, but there was, before I left, I had started to become a wellness coach. And I mean, Kevin, you know, when you're training people, you're life coaching them, you're hearing everything about their life every single time you're working with them. So it, it wasn't a huge transition for me. I was already in service of other people. And really the biggest difference for me is that as a life coach, they come to me, but they make all their own decisions. I actually just ask the right questions, but I let them make all their own choices. As a personal trainer, all they had to do is walk in my door and I took over and basically I, I ruled it. I made them do what I wanted them to do in that hour. They just had to show up. So it's very different. Um, and it's more working from the inside out versus working from the outside in. So, but it's still all working on yourself, right? Yes. Being a holistic. Yeah, because I, I know for me, a lot of the conversation that you, you are having and you're sharing with our, our, our listener, and I hope that if, for those of our listeners that, that have just pulled into um, I guess right now we're we're pulling into the driveway of a family members because this is the holiday uh, weekend or we pulled over for gas and we're listening to the podcast. When you, you hear the word life coach, is life coach on the same level as um, psychiatrists or uh, in, uh, that type of specialty? Uh, and the reason why I'm asking that is because I know that the approach that I take as far as uh, fitness is concerned. Um, I'm more of a cognitive trainer and the physical just happens to, to follow it. So instead of outside, I build up from the inside because I'm, I'm a firm believer. You are who you, you see you are. And a lot of times the conversation that I have with my, my clients is that they don't see what I see. And so the physical is one thing. The interpretation of what you feel you are is another conversation. And within time of what I do, I try to merge those two conversations in. And it's like a paint stroke on a piece of canvas. Once you start to blend the colors, everything starts to look beautiful. So I know when I asked and I told a couple of people I was doing this interview, they wanted to know what was the difference between, and I don't want to offend anyone that's in this profession, but this is the common street language. What's the difference between a life coach and a shrink? And there's a lot of differences. So basically... If you have real psychological problems, you want to go to a, um, a psychiatrist or a psychologist. If you are psychologically pretty well balanced, but you have life challenges, you are, you're unhappy, 
you want a different career, you want to get in a relationship, you want to get out of a relationship, you're stuck. You, I mean, there are, there are um, similarities, but one of the biggest differences is that with life coaching, I help you get from the discrepancy of where you are to where you want to go. And it's more action oriented. It's not talk therapy. You don't just sit with me for an hour And first of all, you never sit with me because it's always on the phone. So I can coach anywhere in the world. But when you're done at the end of the week, you have responsibilities that you've signed on for for the week. You have actionable steps that you're accountable for. When you walk out of a therapist's office, you walk out and you you don't have to think about it unless you want to think about it. And then also a coach shares by example. So if I work with you for three months, by the end of those three months, you know a lot about me. You could go to a therapist for 20 years and not even know if they're married. You could know nothing about them. So it's more of a collaboration when you're working with a life coach. And it's very action-oriented. And usually it's way shorter amount of time. You know, you could go to a therapist for 20 years. If I have a client for more than a year, I I mean, maybe I have one or two clients that I've had for a year or two, but so often they come in, they buy a package of 10, and at the end of the 10, we have uncovered the shadow beliefs, the disempowering beliefs that are keeping them stuck. They've made actionable steps, and they've actually achieved what they want to achieve. I may never see them again. I may see them again a year or two later. They may come in for tune-ups here and there. It's very different than a therapist. All right. All right. Well, I I know this past year, the last 14, 15, 18 months, the the world has gone through a shift. All right. And I'm saying this very lightly. A lot of people uh, had a rough time. Me personally, at the best time of my life outside of getting COVID uh, a month and a half ago, um, I got a lot of things accomplished because I was looking for time in the days. And I was burning the candle at both ends and trying to light it in the middle. But I'm a doer. I'm just one of those people that, you know, I get stuff done and I teach people how to get things done. But a lot of people shifted. Um, Their personal lives changed. Their relationships with their their kids. They found out that, you know, uh, having children was a different definition to actually having children. Because now they showed up every day and they were responsible for them. They also realized that. They were connected to someone else's dream and decided to go ahead and shift and start chasing their own dream. And then they realized that, you know, they had these conversations about what they were going to do and what they always wanted to do when they had time. And now that they had time during COVID, they did nothing. What's the conversation do you have with those people that had a rough time with COVID and come to you? Where do we start with you? Um, a lot of people had a rough time, but once they could actually switch from what's wrong, what am I seeing that's wrong to looking for what's right? It's really a pivot in mindset because there were definitely, obviously a lot of fear around COVID and a lot of fear about being sick and a lot of fear about being stuck at home or losing your jobs. Like we were not all in the same boat. All right. Everyone was in the same water, but everyone was in their same boat. And some boats had more issues than others. And we have to have compassion for that. But for those who just couldn't pivot, who actually weren't, you know, didn't have loved ones that were dying or didn't lose their jobs, but they were just stuck in the muck of their fear, then they needed to learn to be resilient. And they needed help in learning how to switch their mindset. And that's really what it is. It was really a good question on getting out of your fear, stepping out of your comfort zone, and being curious about what else you could do, and then making the changes. So for those who stayed stuck and didn't make changes, that was on them. And if they didn't have a coach, like that's exactly how what I help people do is uncover your fears and uncover your disempowering beliefs that come from the first 10 years of your life. I'm not good enough. I need to play small. I need to stay, you know, small to stay safe. My needs don't matter. My voice doesn't matter. Um, All of this, so many, as many people, there are disempowering beliefs. And those beliefs were, 
were formed in our childhood to keep us safe. They're like, that's how the inner critic gets formed. And they kept us safe as children. But as you grow older, they actually start to cost you instead of help you. And they keep you playing small. So once you uncover them, you see where they came from. You see how they helped you. They see what they cost you now. You can see as an adult, they're not in alignment with where you want to go. I help you make new empowering beliefs. And then I, you know, with different kinds of actions, I help you really hone it in. Like it's a muscle that needs to be used over and over again. So you own it. You can make positive changes in your life. And that's, that's what I help you do. There's no reason for people to stay stuck. I mean, it, it saddens me to think about how many people feel that they have to be in a fearless state before that they can move forward. Or they think that people who are successful are fearless. Well, none, neither one of those things are true. You and I both move forward with our fear. Right. You know, we just we move forward with fear. It's never going to go away, but you can't let it be the thing that stops you. Right. Yeah. And that brings me to a, another mindset. And I, I think that, you know, with my story, with the book that I wrote, Indispensable Games of X's and O's, you know, when people read it, they, they keep telling me, oh, you had such a tough childhood. Your life was so tough. I feel sorry for you. And I'm going, don't feel sorry for me. All right. That was just part of the experience. You know, that was the, the foundation that I had to build on is when you have nothing to go back back to, you don't go back to revisit it. So my mindset is, you know, I struggle with the point when someone wants to take me back to my childhood in order for me to fix who I am today, because they're two different entities and two different experiences. Why, why is it important to drag you back to the most painful part of your life or the lowest part of, of your life in order for you to appreciate the life that you have now or to move on from the life that you have now to improve it? I'm just curious. I'm happy to tell you. It's a great question. And I mean, it's very different than therapy where you're going to go back and you're going to drag your ass through the muck. That's not what we're doing. I will say to you, so where do you feel stuck in your life right now? What's holding you back? Absolutely. Where is the biggest discrepancy? Right. Yeah. And then I'll, and what does that make you feel like? And then I'll take you back in time or to the earliest time we can. When did you first form those feelings? Because those are the feelings and the beliefs that you're playing out over and over and over again. So I'm not taking you back to relive it or to, to, to um, heal it. I'm, I'm taking you back to find out what did you make it mean about you at the earliest time? Like, Kevin, I was playing with matches when I was five years old and I put myself on fire. And I didn't know it till I was 50 years old or 45 that I had the belief that I wasn't safe alone. A five-year-old girl who put herself on fire, that was a brilliant belief. I wasn't safe alone. I put myself on fire. So it was formed to keep me safe. And then I made a commitment to myself to never be alone. So I always had a million girlfriends. I was always around my family. I had a man in my life since I was 13 because I, and I didn't know it, but it's because I never felt safe or happy alone. And when I got divorced and I could have, I really, I was 45 years old. I was attractive. I was an athlete. I was financially secure. I could have gone on and been happy with my life, but I was so broken because this little girl inside of me was so afraid to be alone. Once I found that out and uncovered it and brought it to my conscious mind, I could see, well, well that's, you know, I don't need that belief anymore. I'm 45 years old. I'm safe alone. I'm happy alone. And so all of the beliefs around it, all of the habits and the way I was living my life could just change because I could now give myself a new empowering belief and move forward. I wasn't dragging myself back to stay at the fire. But I needed that. I needed to extract that information. And so, yes, you have to be willing to go back and look at it, not to stay in it, 
but to say, what's your wounds, Kevin? What did you make that time mean about you? Because that wound is playing itself out over and over again. You're attracting situations and people into your life over and over and over again. Let's say you had a terrible childhood and you decided that you were unlovable. Well, you will prove that over and over again. You will attract people in your life that don't really love you. Or you will attract somebody into your life that loves you, but because you believe you're unlovable, you ruin the relationship. And one after another, relationships are being ruined. And you're saying, see, I told you I'm unlovable. Because our ego wants to be right. So we actually fight for the limitations that we set for ourselves. Once you uncover it and you say, wait a minute, I'm a 50-year-old guy. I'm good looking. I'm this, I'm that. Of course I'm lovable. And here's my proof. My son loves me, right? So once you can uncover it and as an adult, figure out where you want to go and what you want to do and not have to have those beliefs that have been holding you back your whole life that you're not even aware of. It makes your whole life change. Wow. That was, and I just want to tell you, those of you that have just pulled over on the side of the road or stopped doing whatever you were doing, I will tell you from experience, it's hard to take advice from someone that's never been on the same trip that you are now planning to take. And listening to, and I know other levels to, to Nancy's story, she, she is not taking you someplace that she had just turned over a brochure in life and said, this is how we fix and this is how we're going to travel. She has taken you, and, and I will tell you, for those of you that are listening to this on audio, you cannot see Miss Nancy. She is a strong, confident, vivacious, extremely attractive and don't go me too. I'm not ready to go to jail for that. This is a professional observation. And listen to this story. When I went through my divorce, I thought I was the only person that went through it. All right. I was worried about what my children thought. And I always said, you know, my my biggest Achilles heel is not what other people think about me as how my my children will perceive me in the world. But I also made a conscious thought that I was going to live life to the fullest so my, my children would have a choice on the decisions they made when they started to make decisions on their own and using me as an example. It's like my grandfather always told me, he says, knock you down once, get up again. Knock you down twice, he says, get back up. He says, knock you down four times, he says, duck. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, you know, I, I had a, a lot of life experience, but one of the ongoing conversations that I hear and in my business, in my profession, even when I'm talking to young people about making choices and how their choices are responsible for the actions and the results of their life, I hear one thing. I can't. I don't know if I can do that. I'm afraid to make these choices. What's fear, Nancy? Fear is really the the little voice inside you that thinks you're not enough. And you know what, Kevin, no matter what your shadow belief is, they basically all go down to unworthy. I'm not enough. Like I was brought up that I could do anything. I was the baby of three girls. My mother, I was like the light of my mother's eyes. And she made me believe that I was special. Well, guess what? On the other end of special is unworthy. So you can go hopping around your life feeling really special until your husband wants out after 26 years and you were very other referenced. I only saw myself through his eyes. So if he no longer wanted me, I obviously wasn't very special anymore. And so it's, a, it's, it's the other end of a spectrum. You either grow up and you have a childhood where you think you're unworthy or you grow up and you think you're, ch- you're special and then life happens to you and you end up thinking you're unworthy. So at the end of the day, deep down in our darkest soul, we all have this piece of us, the imposter syndrome, the inner critic, the I'm not good enough. And I've gotten to a point in my life now that even when I hear it, 
I tell myself, I'm going because I know that growth is on the other side. Like I just built this course for LinkedIn Learning and Gen Connect You. And I was thinking, who am I to do that? You know, like I'm not that. Mm -hmm. And then I say to myself, well, obviously you are that. They invited you to build this course. So build it. And even you will then know that you are that. So we, we don't see ourselves as other people see us. Like my book won four awards this year. It won, you know, best new nonfiction, international nonfiction. It won best uh, book in mind and spirit. And of course, I'm, 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 I'm liking it and I'm loving it, but I'm still thinking, well, but it's just me and my little book. How is that? Like, how is that happening? Because we don't, we don't actually see it. We can't feel it. Like when you were saying that your clients don't see themselves the way you see them. Well, my clients don't see themselves. The way they see themselves is not the way they are. It's the way they see themselves. Right. And it's very different. I mean, if you look at my body and I look at my body, we're seeing different things. Right. And that's just, you know, I have a story. Somebody said to me, like, well, you climbed Kilimanjaro. And like, what was the first thing you thought of when you got back to your room at the end of Kilimanjaro? And what, you know, what, how was the whole, what was that all about? And I said, it was the most unbelievably spiritual um, awakening for me because I went at 61 years old. And I was up there for eight days. And because I'm an overtrainer and I was a trainer, I like, I, nobody could keep up with me. I live in altitude. I overtrained my ass. They were all in their 20s and 30s. And I ended up with my own guides because I was not willing to go at the speed that they were going at. And they were not trained like I was. And this was my big event. And so I just said, I'm not doing it. Like, and I, they finally gave me a guide or two that, I got to go at my own pace every day and have my own experience. So at the top, I felt like I'm the only one that didn't get sick. And I really, I busted my butt and I did great and I feel great. And it's amazing. I'm so proud of myself and la, 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 la. Right. I get all the way down to the bottom and I get into the hotel room. And I had read this book about this woman who climbed Kilimanjaro and she got back to her hotel room and she took off all her clothes and she was so emaciated. She looked like she was 12 years old, right? I'm 61. I get down there. I take off all my clothes and like, I am swollen from head to toe. I'm like so swollen and I'm looking at myself like, oh my God, I can't believe that's what I look like. And I say to myself, I couldn't even be proud of myself for like one day. Right. It's like, that's what women do. They, they, they're, they bash themselves on how they look. And basically like in a day, all of that swelling was gone, but I just couldn't even keep my high going because our inner critic is always shouting at us. Right. And, and that's the conversation. I know our listeners are listening to this and going, Oh, that's me too. And I, I, I know with me earlier today, I had a conversation because, you know, the reason why talking with, W.I.T., Kevin and Son, everyone automatically assumes that since 40 years plus, and I'm 62, so I'm a li little bit older than you. No, uh, I'm 65. Oh, I'm a baby <laughs> compared to you. All right. Hey, girl, you're killing it. You are killing it. I'm going to tell you, anyone on eHarmony, look, <laughs> I'm going to tell you. All right. All right. You, you cannot fail here. But what, what, I, what I wanted to say to you is I had a conversation because um, most people think the only thing I can do is talk fitness. But I've had a life experience, and it's the reason why I wrote my book, that spans the globe. I have talked to corporate America. This weekend, I had a conversation, um, the conversations that leading to sales. And I left people with two, two things to think about. I asked questions. If you know the difference between a growth mindset and a fixed mindset, and I know with your experience that you're going to do a lot better job of explaining that mindset in regards to changing your life or having your life remaining the same because you're disregarding the information that you are taking in, that you sought out sitting across from you on a computer, a phone, or um, the homework that you gave them. If you could address what a growth mindset is first 
and then follow up that with a fixed mindset and talk directly to our listeners. Okay. So if you're somebody who is a perfectionist or, uh, um, oh, I'm doing the wrong one first. You want the growth one first. Whatever right. you decide to do. Okay. All right. All right. You're talking. Okay. We're just talking. So if you're somebody who's a perfectionist and only does the things that you know you're going to do well and doesn't like to try new things because you may not do them well, you have a fixed mindset. And that comes from low confidence. That comes from being told as a little kid, oh, you're so Johnny, you're so good at this. You're so good at this. You're so good at that. And you, you only want to be, you only want to do the things you're good at because you, you've made that your thing. I'm so good at these things. That's a fixed mindset. And what happens is that you're not willing to try new things. You don't step out of your comfort zone and you really don't grow. You only grow in the things you might become excellent in the thing you're good at, but there's a zillion things you won't do. A growth mindset really knows that the juice is in the journey. And it's not about the success, even though everyone likes success. It's in the joy of doing and growing and being. I will try any sport. I will, I will try. Every, I'm learned, like I went on Clubhouse. I had never been on. I first got on and I thought, oh, my God, everyone's so young. I'm too old. I can't do this. And I thought that's ridiculous. And now I, I moderate four rooms. I mean, I'm up there for the challenge of anything. I'm always like growth is one of my core values. So a growth mindset is all about trying new things and seeing what sticks. Throw 20 ideas at the, on the wall and whatever sticks, that's where you go. And I, as a parent, if you're listening to this and you're a parent, teaching your children that it's okay to fall and it's okay to fail and the more often, the better you are. Stop asking them, you know, what did you do well today? And ask them, what did you do wrong today? How did you fail today? What did you learn from that? What can you do better from that? What, like, what's the lesson there? And tell them, oh, you won't believe what I did today. This is how I messed up today. You know, it's not about perfection. I don't even tell my grandchildren, oh, you're such a great this. I'll say... You were so brave to try that. I mean, my seven, six, and two five-year-old grandchildren, they call me and they're like, Nana, I was bigger, better, braver today. I was afraid to do this, but I did it anyway. That's the goal. That's what you, that, that makes for a growth mindset in your children. Uh, and if you don't have it, it's going to be harder for them to get it. But you, that's the way to get it for them. And believe it or not, I am so happy you said that because we are all at a crossroad right now in our life. And moms and dads, brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles, you, you all have to realize that life is all about choices. You also also have to realize if you have young kids, the first example of how to deal with life, how to love, how to treat other people comes from the people that brought you into the world. If their view of the world is linear, then you're only going to see in a straight line. But if you have that view of the world and you see multiple colors and whatever, then it's just beautiful. Um, you said something. You had three words that led into you becoming a best-selling author. She has a beautiful book. I know right now it's available on Amazon. It's also available on Audible. Do you mind enlightening us and sharing with us how this book came about, what the book is about? Again, reiterate where you can get it and just jam on. And tell your son yes. if he wants to sit down, have a seat. I'd like to meet your son. Oh, he's not here. That's after the door just opened at the okay. wind. Um, he's upstairs, but thank All you. Right. Yeah, you'd like him, Kevin. He would All be right. a great podcaster. All right. So bigger, better, braver, conquer your fears, embrace your courage, and transform your life. And here's my book. Case bigger, better, braver. Braver. All right. And so the book is a step-by-step -step how to. 
it's like, Kevin, I coach one-on-one and um, I also do group coaching and then I have a live course, but not everybody can afford any of those. And this book, everybody can basically afford. You can even get it from the library or you can get it on Audible and while you're walking or hiking or biking or driving, you can listen to me. It's my voice. That was another me being in Bigger, Better, Braver, by the way. And it's a step-by-step how to get out of autopilot, how to give up your excuses, how to uncover. There's exercises in each chapter on uncovering those disempowering beliefs and your underlying commitments and how to get your ducks in a row to take a leap and how to get the, the work you need and learn and ask for what you need. And there's a whole chapter around growth mindset versus fixed mindset. And basically it's to help you on your own do what I do with my clients. And so it's 10 different chapters to take you from uncovering your vision, from what your soul wants for you, all the way to taking the leap and even talks about falling and failing and getting back up and not letting failure stop you. And it's just a how to do it. It's what's your Kilimanjaro. It starts with my, my, my Kilimanjaro and my divorce and, and what that meant to me and how it broke me and how I, I gained, um, how I learned to love myself again by how I stopped being other referred or other referenced because I was only seeing myself through the eyes of my husband. And I had to like rebuild myself to remember who I was when I knew who I was and I could do anything and I could build my confidence and it teaches you how to do all of that. And my, my listeners, I, I hope you took in this conversation and the message Nancy just gave you like a glass of fine wine. Let it hit the back of your tongue. Let it slowly flow down so you taste all the elements of how it was um, created. But I also want you to, to, to understand, you know, life is about risk. Every single day you wake up in, in the morning, you take another shot at either doing something exceptionally well or you take another shot of doing something you've always done that's going to give you the same results. I'm going to ask Nancy because I heard her say that she climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. I've known three people that have climbed it. I would love to say why, but I also know this question is going to lead on, you know, what's the biggest risk you took? Because I know Mount Kilimanjaro is not the biggest risk. That that was a, a exclamation point on you you moving forward in your life. It was not the biggest risk you took. Tell me. Oh, I think writing the book and getting on podcasts and doing speaking engagements and I was on extra TV. I mean, all of those things were me always having to step forward and building the course. Every single thing I've done since I've written the book has, I don't know if risk is the right word, but it's made me step out of my comfort zone over and over and over again. And Kevin, I don't know about you, but when you write a book, it's like the universe wants to throw more and more and more of it in your face. Oh, you think you're bigger, better, braver? Try this one on. Like that's what my life has become ever since I wrote the book. Well, believe it or not, when you since you threw it back my way with the book, when I wrote my book, it came out of a, a mental illness. Um, I got a concussion. And did not realize that I had kept a journal from 1973 to March 1st, 2019, because March 2nd, I experienced my concussion, basically like a hard drive. If you look at the matrix and I explain to people, this is how my mind works and it's working that way right now, is anytime I get anxious, I get confused. Sometimes I stutter. I can't remember words and I can't spell words. And I'm a published author. But looking back at my journal, I had documented every single moment or a significant event of my life from 1973 to March 1st, my last entry, 2019. I also discovered that I almost made it through college, my junior year, without formally being able to read or write and made up my mind that I was not going to graduate a dumb jock. And look at me now, a three-time wow. author. I am talking to uh, a best-selling author, 
a certified life coach. And yes, getting on this mic, I suffer the same anxiety that people um, have in talking from a crowd. The only difference is I love making a difference in people's life. And when I write a book, just like you, I look at the fact there's 241 million people in the United States. There's 8 billion on this planet. If I wrote something that changes the life of one single person, then I've accomplished my goal. And so like, like you, my book is nominated for an award. And I'll find out August, Oct- October 11th if I am one of the uh, recipients. So now I'm a finalist. So hopefully next time I talk to you, we'll be able to share some space. But yeah. I always like to ask my guests, all right, your biggest takeaway or what you want to leave with um, my listeners, our listeners, because you are now part of the family, all right? What do you want to leave our listeners with? And everyone just pulled over and stopped. Life is on the other side of your comfort zone. So get comfortable with being uncomfortable and all of the anxiety and all of the angst and all of the drama stops the moment you step in. And then the way you will feel about yourself, the way you will love yourself, just for stepping in, that's where the juice is. And that's where the juice is, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to ask her one more question. She's not prepared for this. I always ask, ASK, if you had one big ask and someone, my listener or someone that's sharing this podcast or someone is like this podcast can grant you that one ask and make it big, girl. What would that ask be? Oh, the people sign up for my my course and they buy my book and they leave a review on Amazon for me or Barnes and Nobles or anywhere books are sold. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to tell you for my listeners before we wrap up this podcast, my ask for Nancy is much bigger. I <laughs> want Nancy to be a global sensation. I want her to travel the world as part of a tour with people like me, changing the lives of every single person every single day, allowing people to get out of their own way and allow them to live large. We, Nancy, you and I are two people. We got to go out. Let's do it. We got to do the world for this. We, because the world's just not ready for it. So I'm going to say right now is that we've covered a lot of information and hopefully we made you think we made you feel, feel a little something, a special kind of way. We've enlightened you. We've touched your soul that may change the way that you view your life from where you sit right now. If you have not followed us, if you have not liked us, if you have not shared any of the episodes that we've ever created by RMK Production, this is one that you should like, you should share. We can be reached at www.rmkproductions.net or Talking With Kevin and Son. This episode was brought to you by Sam Sarah Gear, the fashions that was designed with love. You can reach Samsung Sarah Gear at www.samsaragear.com. There is a promotional code that goes along with this episode. It's C-I-C-A-D-A-2021. The purchase of any garment, you'll get 10% off. Also, Frank Rappaport, the owner, will donate another 20% to Heart Your Mind Charitable Trust. It's one he created to benefit people that were recovering from eating disorders. Any questions that you may have asked, you can you can contact Nancy directly at your Q, Nance. Oh, Nancy Picard. So it's N-A-N-C-Y. P-I-C-K-A-R-D, lifecoach.com. And I offer anybody a free discovery call so you can see whether coaching is something that uh, is in your future. And do you have room for a couple of new clients because people just parked over, honked their horn three times. They, they <laughs> wave, I do. They dapped a little bit, say, how do we get in touch? So if you got- Yes, I do. And ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you, all right? When you're a coach, you speak from experience, 
When you're making a difference in life, you're an example of the conversation that you, you have. And when you're someone like Nancy, you are consistent as producing results in the people that, that um, come to you for your service. But the big thing is, in order to ask for help, you have to reach out and ask for help. In order to get help, you have to be open to change the behaviors and the habits that have left you in the position that you're in right now. So as m I appreciate my loyal fans, the listeners, and I hope you enjoyed this episode of People You Should Know. And Nancy is definitely one of those people you should know. And she has a story that uh, needs to be told. And this is only the first layer of that story. So please subscribe, share. And if anyone you know, including you, Nancy, that would like to, to sit in on another episode of Talking With Kevin and someone that you should know, I would ask you to reach out and share that person with us. My hashtag is find 1000 reasons to be kind to someone. My grandfather always said, when you get to a position that you're able to help someone, it was your duty to do so. Reach one, teach one. My good friend, uh, Mr. Sanderson, Mr. Dave Sanderson, he was the last passenger to exit the plane on the miracle on the Hudson. He always says, turn one turmoil into a triumph. Mm -hmm. And with that said, I'm going to say fade to black and we are out.